Now to introduce this week's main speaker is your VP of Programs, Beth Knox. Thank you, President Jeff. It is uh, certainly my honor to introduce our main speaker today. Chris Gregoire is the CEO of Challenge Seattle, which is an alliance of CEOs from 17 of the region's largest private sector employers who work together to ensure the greater Seattle area continues to thrive as one of the most vibrant, innovative, and globally competitive regions in the world. Now, previously, Chris served for two terms as Washington's governor with a $32 billion biennial budget and over 60,000 employees. As governor, Chris is credited with numerous accomplishments, including creating the Department of Early Learning, historical investment in infrastructure, which resulted in building the largest floating bridge in the world and the largest transportation tunnel to open up Seattle's waterfront. In her second term, she helped position the state as one of the most financially secure to come out of the Great Recession. Prior to becoming governor, Chris served for three terms as attorney general and before that as the director of the State Department of Ecology. Currently, she is a member and former chair of the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center and member of the National Bipartisan Governors Council. She holds a JD from Gonzaga University and a BA and teaching certificate from the University of Washington. She's also a graduate of the Harvard Executive Management Program. She's been married to her husband, Mike, for over 40 years. They have two children, Courtney and Michelle, and four grandchildren. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that in 2014, Chris joined her good friend and fellow Rotarian, Dorothy Bullitt, as part of the esteemed Seafair Royalty, having served as Queen Elcyon. And it was truly my pleasure to work with Chris in that capacity and we welcome you here today. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Beth. It's a delight to, to be with you. Uh, uh, we've been together now for several years, starting with that being able to be queen. Thank you for seeing me through that year. I wasn't exactly sure what it would entail, uh, but it was delightful. And Jeff, thank you uh, as well for the invitation. I'm very, very appreciative of it. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I hope we are seeing the beginning of uh, return to uh, a degree of normalcy. Uh, and it seems we are by virtue of your conversation about your meeting that will be in person in the future. So congratulations. Uh, I bet it's gonna be great to see each other. So as Beth indicated, uh, I, I'm in charge of a group now 21 uh, members uh, of Challenge Seattle who want to give back to the community at large through their civic engagement and civic leadership. And when uh, George Floyd was killed last year and we saw the demonstrations in, in, in Seattle and so on, there was a lot of call for major employers to make a statement. And when I met with my employers in an emergency meeting, the CEOs uh, questioned whether they were ready to issue a statement collectively, knowing full well as the largest employers it would have an impact. And we agreed at that meeting that it was premature to make a statement then uh, because we had a lot of work to do. We needed to understand the depth uh, of the issues of racial inequity in our community, in our state, and in our corporate workplace. And in order to do that, it would take some time. And so we set about last June to do that. We brought on board Boston Consulting Group. We asked them to take a deep dive into data so that we could see statistically differentials with regard to whites in Washington state, black Washingtonians, as well as, as looking at other uh, races as well. We asked them to do some things that uh, frankly are rarely done. To look at the life of an individual throughout that lifetime and the various stages in their life and what happened to them in terms of equity, what happened in terms of their ability to pass on generation to generation, and to look at uh, racial equality in not just silos like the justice system, but across uh, five sectors so that we could be well informed about what the challenges uh, and, and for that matter, the opportunities would be. So uh, first slide, if you would, please, Lindsay. We began to agree with the, the national conversation. It, it was urgent that, that we begin the process of 
talking about exactly what it was by way of being anti-racist. Uh, do we have it in Washington state? If not, why not? And what do we do in order to ensure that we are? So BCG gathered the data. Uh, uh, we're not able to get those slides up yet for some reason, but anyway, BCG gathered the data. We had about 70 interviews with various experts and community members and business leaders to get a feel for the challenges that uh, Black Washingtonians face. Um, we learned all of the CEOs of Challenge Seattle, as well as our partner, the Washington Roundtable CEOs, went through training by a, a group called the Racial Equity Institute out of North Carolina. Um, and they began to see that Seattle, Washington is no different than any other city in America. King County is no different than any other county in America, and the state is no different. And that's not good news, uh, that's bad news because it tells us the racial inequities that we found in our city, in our county, in our state are prevalent across the country. From that, uh, the CEOs indicated they wanted to begin the process of making a difference and a change. So we engaged them in developing a set of commitments. They decided they wanted to issue a report publicly so that they could share what they had learned with other others in the business community and others in the community at large. And they wanted to build a coalition of employers who would join them in the fight against racial inequality in our community and in our state. So let me talk real briefly about the report findings. And I'm sorry we're not able for some reason to get the slides up, but let me just share with you the report findings, key findings. Black Washingtonians and their families experience significant disadvantages across virtually every facet of their lives. The inequities that they encounter compound over time and across generations. And disparities exist uh, across regardless of their social economic status or their educational levels. And COVID-19 and the recession have magnified, peeled the onion back in another way of saying it, the impacts and the deepening racial inequalities that we find here in our state. The disadvantages across multiple facets of life include from the day that child is born or not born, uh, 2.3 times uh, greater mortality death for black Washingtonian children uh, than, than whites. Um, those who are suspended in school in K through 12, 3.7 times greater than whites incarcerated as an adult seven times greater, denied alone over five times greater. It gives you an example of the facets in life of a Black Washingtonian and how they see disparities throughout that, those various aspects of their life. The inequities compound over time and over their life and cross generationally. 16% are less likely to receive prenatal health care. So that's, that's, Pre-birth, 30% are more likely to be taught by a less experienced teacher. That's your experience in the K through 12 system. They earn about 74 cents on the dollar compared to their uh, white colleagues and 45% less likely to own a home. They accumulate 87% less in net worth and 66% less likely to transfer the wealth to the next generation. <clears throat> Again, through the facets of life, also through uh, crossing into generationally, these inequities perpetuate. So we looked at, as I mentioned to you, not just one, what is it like in the corporate workplace or what is it like with regard to the criminal justice system, but five aspects, healthcare, education, criminal justice, the corporate workplace, and personal finance. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. And again, I apologize, we're not able to show you this by slide. There are higher incidence of infant mortality, asthma, diabetes, and HIV infection. Home mortgage denial rate in Washington is 13% for black applicants compared to 8% for whites. Black entrepreneurs are asked for more personal income tax statements 28% more often than white applicants. Black-owned businesses account for 1% of the state's businesses, 
and an average uh, revenue of 2.3 times smaller than similarly sized white owned businesses. Black students, 13 percentage points less likely than white students with identical transcripts to be recommended for advanced courses. And the graduation rate is approximately 10% lower. In the criminal justice system, uh, black defendants receive harsher punishments for the exact same crime disproportionately. Black Americans are 43% more likely to be pulled over and 2.3 times more likely to be searched by law enforcement. And in the corporate workplace, black execs account for less than 1.9% in corporate leadership roles. So we dug deeper, of course, in the corporate workplace because that's what we think is, is our, our lane and something that is our responsibility and we need to take action. And what we found is that black talent is underrepresented in the higher paying positions and leadership roles in the corporate workplace. Black employees face barriers to promotion and career achievement and black owned businesses make up a disproportionately small share of corporate spend, in other words, suppliers. So let me give you an example. Those from college to professional, in other words, we graduate from college and look for a professional job. What we found is in terms of promotion rates, 50% for blacks, 77% for whites, uh, for Latinx, 73%, and for Native Americans, 76%. So again, 50% for Blacks, a dramatic difference than other races and, and also um, obviously a less likelihood of them to be able to begin the process of climbing the corporate ladder. So now let me uh, talk if I can a little bit about the three areas that we decided ultimately with this information, we'd make a commitment. One, these CEOs of the Washington Roundtable and Challenge Seattle were actually fairly surprised, to say the least, by this information. Uh, yes, there is racial inequity, but no one appreciated the extent, how much it occurred in the course of a lifetime, and how it transferred generation to generation, the depth and the breadth. And I think they found that clearly compelling to the degree that they are absolutely committed to make something happen. And not just for now, but a commitment forever in the corporate workplace in Washington state. So we made three areas of commitment. One, to drive racial equity in the corporate workplace. Two, to advocate at policies, whether at the local level or at the state level, for community and public policies that would advance racial equality, and three, to provide information publicly that would show they are holding themselves accountable. accountable. So first on the commitment to the corporate workplace. What we found by interviews, I know we're proud of wanting to say that we're a community of inclusion, but the interviews of those with lived experience, Black Seattleites, say otherwise. They indicate that they don't feel welcome in Seattle uh, and the population of Blacks in Seattle is about where it was in the 60s. Uh, it's declining. The same is true in the corporate workplace. So we made a commitment to make the corporate workplace uh, welcoming to all races. Now you would say that that's fairly simple. In fact, it's very complex. And particularly when you're trying to design a metric that will measure yourself as to whether you've achieved, we're in the process of doing that now. Secondly, we want a workforce that reflects the community. In the state of Washington, Black Washingtonians represent about 4% of the population. In King County, it's about 7% of the population. So we want the corporate workplace to be representative of the community in which we all reside. We want uh, parity and compensation. We want increased Black representation in management and leadership. We want to increase internships. So right now I'm working with the deans of all the business schools in the state, public and private, as to how they can, through internships and a whole number of mechanisms, be able to 
help us be sure that we are giving internships that will lead to good jobs to avoid that statistic, which shows uh, the amount of black Washingtonians who graduate and then don't have a job in the corporate sector like they hoped they would. We are also working with university presidents, uh, asking them to join us in an effort to ensure that their graduates are getting good jobs in the state. Chris, We're looking Chris I'm sorry, this is Caroline. I'm just gonna interrupt you because Lindsay sent me her slides. So if you want me to share anything, I can. Oh, all right. Um, if you would put this one up, it's a, a commitment to progress. If you can okay. share that slide, that'd be great. We wanna increase the diversity and racial equity among supplier networks. What we found in the corporate workplace is most corporations have had the exact same suppliers for who knows how long. And uh, built into that is uh, a kind of an insurance that, um, keep going if you would please, um, keep ensuring that in essence, it's not open to competition for black employers. Keep going. One more. And here we are. Oh, back up. There you go. Thanks. Um, so we want to increase not only the number of uh, black owned businesses, but we also want them to grow. And what we have found is even if you have a black owned business, all too often they don't grow. So one of the ways we can contribute to that is open up the competition in the supplier network of all these corporations and make a commitment to, to do so. We made a commitment to invest a combined $2 billion in corporate community and philanthropic efforts in the next five years. These are monies not that we will send out, but that the companies themselves will send out uh, in order to support the community at large uh, so that we can uh, make sure that those who otherwise wouldn't be given a chance to do the kinds of things we're talking about will be able to with the philanthropic giving of the corporate sector. Uh, next slide, please. Secondly, we indicated we wanted to advocate for uh, our communities. Interestingly enough, those of us who uh, lived through the late 60s uh, believed that we had made immense progress with regard to racial equity in our country. And now we know that progress wasn't we had, what we had hoped, nor what we set out to achieve. But at no time really during that period were we tracking whether in fact we'd been successful or failed, and if we'd failed, why, and took a course correction. So what we're advocating here is through the state, we need to be able to have a robust data system that tracks this and tells us whether we're making progress or not, and allows us the opportunity to take a course correction. And we don't want it in silos like is typically done, but rather the means by which we had BCG do it across the lifetime of an individual generation to generation, and not in siloed uh, areas, but including experience in education, healthcare, criminal justice, the workplace, and personal finance. Secondly, we want to advocate at the community level and the state level uh, for the growth of Black-owned businesses, racial disparities, and we want to start with educational attainment, and we also are starting with home ownership. So we're dealing with all of the banks right now to ask in the application process, why are there such disparities in terms of the asks of black applicants compared to that of others? And so we're trying to get at the heart of what the problem is here so we can give that opportunity for home ownership that can be passed generation to the next. Uh, next slide, please. So we do make a commitment to remain transparent and accountable. Uh, we want this not to be a short term, this CEO term only, but to one to pass generation to generation of CEOs in the corporate workplace. We've hired a uh, executive director, Philip Jacobs. Uh, he is in the process now of working diligently uh, with our community to ask what we can do. And that community means the state because this is a statewide effort. We're in the process and will, by the end of the year, have uh, a baseline uh, statistically on all of our commitments. We will set measurable targets. We will assess the progress and we will publicly report the collective results. And where necessary, take course correction to ensure that we meet our targets. And we're trying to encourage others in the private sector to join us in this effort. 
So if you choose, if you're a CEO or a member of a company with a CEO who might be interested, we would welcome you. Um, last slide, please. We are a coalition now. We began uh, with a, a really small number, actually, and we have over 80 uh, who have joined CEOs across the state. And we are the founding sponsors, our Challenge Seattle and the Washington Roundtable, but our supporting sponsors are the others that are listed there, and that group is also growing. So we know this is not an easy undertaking on our part, but it is an undertaking that is a mandate. Uh, based on the data, uh, based on the statistics, it's undeniable that we have systemic racism in our community and in our state. And the corporate sector plays a major role in addressing and solving this problem. Now we start, uh, interestingly enough, uh, by dealing only with black Washingtonians, unless of course we're advocating in the legislature, in which case we're advocating for all persons of color. But we start with black Washingtonians because of a 400 year history and because of the data and the disproportionality. But once we are going and believe that we are achieving success with regard to black Washingtonians, we wanna to open to all other, to make sure that at the end of the work, if there isn't ever an end of our work, that we've ensured equity and equality across the entire state. So that's a little bit about our effort and our journey to get there. And with that, Beth, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much. That's awesome. That is very, uh, that's a lot of information and I'm glad, uh, glad you're here today to share that all with you, uh, with us. I will get started on some questions. Chris, are you working on issues, structural inequality with corporate leaders in other states? You know, interestingly enough, uh, I guess what we have done is considered fairly unique. So we had reach outs from others in other states, most particularly uh, Oregon. And Oregon is asked if they can literally plagiarize our commitment uh, and put it in place in Oregon. And we have made it clear, this is not about Seattle or King County or Washington state. The issues that we find here are issues across the nation. And we ask everybody and anybody to join in the effort. So the answer to the question is yes, because the information is getting out now, the report is getting out, and businesses, uh, leadership, organizations are calling and asked to join the effort. Uh, speaking of which then, are these statistics available online? On yes, if, uh -huh. you can look at the report, uh, the Challenge Seattle website, uh, where you can uh, see the report in full. Let me go back then a second. You started today's conversation. This is me now asking this question because I'm because I'm a geek about this. But you started this conversation like you know, let's think nationally. Let's bring it down to the state, down to the right. And then you were shocked. That it's like, oh wait, we're just the same as everybody else. Speaking of which, then can you share your findings with like literally just send it out and say, listen, if you're facing the same thing, here's here's a roadmap or you know um, uh, suggestions that we have seen. So we're doing that through Boston Consulting Group. As you may or may not be aware, Boston Consulting Group uh, consults with corporations all across the country. And uh, we were their first uh, group to work with on this issue. But what they have informed us is the questions that we've asked, the work they've done for us is now being asked by corporate everywhere in the country and being shared everywhere in the country as uh, a model of how to start. Now, I can't, I can't, I don't want to suggest we're successful, uh, but I do think we have a blueprint uh, that is really good. Uh, now it's our job to implement it, but I, I want to be clear. We've also said to any other corporation, you can't just plagiarize our commitment. You need to take yourself on a journey. You need to listen and to learn as we did. Uh, you need to read. You need to talk with black employees. You need to be open. You need to understand it's not gonna be a comfortable conversation, but you need to go through your own listening learning process and then make the commitment because that commitment will be so much greater than if you just plagiarize it. You need to understand it's not just in your workplace or your community or your state, it's everywhere in the country. So 
it's going to take literally all of us working together to make sure it works. Yeah, I would agree. It sounds like you've got to go through this journey yourself. So you have some ownership of this conversation. You just don't grab it. It's not a cookie cutter. Now yeah. that you have shared your data in on an equity with corporate leaders, what is your plan for following their progress in making necessary changes and sharing that progress with the public? So what we're intending to do is uh, come up with the baseline <clears throat> where we are with respect to all of our commitments. Now you would say, well, that's pretty simple. Well, it's actually not. What's the baseline to understand a corporate culture? Uh, so these are challenging metrics that we're coming up with. So we're taking our time being thoughtful and trying to get it right. Um, at, at, when we get done establishing that baseline, then we're going to establish the goals for 2020 uh, or 2030, excuse me, uh, with the idea that, quite frankly, if we achieve a goal, well, then we, we failed. We should have had a, a much more aggressive goal. So we're trying to be realistic, but also push ourselves towards the kind of goals that we want to achieve. And our, our right now our thinking is we will report out our success, failure, whatever on those metrics and those goals every two years publicly so that uh, everybody fully understands. We did that, we said that to employers who wanted to join our work by saying, we need to have pressure on ourselves. We need to be willing to say publicly. And the more we say publicly, I think the more we will work harder and make sure that we get it done, which is how we put pressure on ourselves. But it's also to put pressure on the community because uh, let's, let's assume that these 80 CEOs achieve every one of their goals. We will not have achieved racial equity in the state of Washington. It is going to take everybody in every sector, nonprofit, public, private, community, to gang together if we're going to be able to do this. So we, we're saying this sector is willing to share. What are you doing? Are you doing your part? Are you engaging? We need your help. We need your partnership. This is audacious to say the least. All right, here comes a big long question. Given that African-Americans were denied access to the GI Bill for education, denied FHA loans to acquire housing and the corresponding wealth that part to pass down to heirs and equal access to health, along with many other inequities you describe, is there some form of red re reparation appropriate? Oof e.g. no interest education loans, low rate mortgages with extended terms, low rate cost comprehensive health insurance? So <clears throat> number one, whoever asked the question, we think, I think you're spot on asking the question and looking at this in, in the manner in which you just said. Um, so we are looking now at the banks and asking one, how do you get out of the inequities that are, the statistic inequities that are present. Why are you asking for a tax return? How many times are you asking for a tax return? Or let me give you an example. How about in employment? If, if there is absolutely no relevance whatsoever to the job you're asking the person to perform and the fact that they were convicted of a misdemeanor or even a felony, when you look at the disproportionality of penalties to black Washingtonians, then why do you disqualify them when that's when you ask that question on the employment form? So we're asking a lot of these questions, but let me also be clear. This is our advocacy role in Olympia, in city councils, in county councils, and in the state legislature. But we're really committed, first and foremost, we got a lot of work to do in the corporate workplace and we're gonna do our best. So we began the conversation nonetheless with the legislative leadership about when we look at uh, discipline of children and you look at the number where the discipline is discretionary by the teacher versus the discipline that is mandatory because of whatever conduct. When it's discipline of the, of the student discretionary, dramatically greater uh, discipline against black uh, students. When it's mandatory, it's based on the facts of what the, what the child did, it's less than whites. How do you, how do you uh, 
how can you convince anybody that that's, that's equal, that's right, that's fair? So we're looking at a lot of deep dive statistics, bringing that to the legislative uh, body and saying to them, you got a lot of work to do because there's a lot of baked in inequities. It's not just, it's baked into rules, it's baked into laws, it's baked into uh, regulations. So what do we do about it? This year, for the first time in history, the governor actually began in his budgetary process to look at any and all evidence of the budget that was either perpetuating or was in and of itself uh, inequitable. The legislature in producing its budget did the exact same thing. So they're taking steps now that are historically never been done. At the same time now we're saying to them, you need to start looking at your rules and your regulations and your laws because built into them are also inequities and how are you going to address that? So uh, to, the, to the individual's question on home ownership, for example, one of the things we said to the legislature is you give rental assistance uh, to low income members of the BIPOC community. How about you convert that to rent to own? Allow the person to see the opportunity to actually own. So those are some of the ideas, but we don't pretend, again, we're working on the corporate workplace first and we don't pretend, we understand that the leadership in the black community needs to be a major decision-making partner and how we correct the injustices and the inequities of the past. So we're looking to them to give us some of the ideas, some of the experiences they've had, if we're going to be successful. I didn't see any big uh, African-American groups on your last slide of partners. Is that coming? Is that something that sort of just gets integrated as you go along? So great, absolutely great. Because you know how many black CEOs we have in Washington state? Less than 1.9%. Correct. So uh, on, our, on our list, you will see about 1.9%. Well, I think that's embarrassing. But we made it such that a corporation couldn't sign on. The CEO had to make the personal commitment on behalf of the corporation. So, and we wanted to highlight. I mean, we're the first to admit there are not enough members of the BIPOC community or in a leadership role of the companies in this state. Put that into perspective really quickly. How many, what percentage of businesses in this state are owned by women? You can well, make it up, we won't know. Pardon? You can make it up. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not my personality. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I can't. Uh, I can't, I can't give you the statistic. I'm okay. sorry. That's fine. All right. Now on for some real questions. Now that your group has issued a report, have you started to take concrete steps within your member companies? And you started to touch on this a couple of minutes ago with cities and state leaders. So, yes, um, we're not, I mean, we, we, we announced this at the end of the year, last year. Uh, we spent a considerable time making sure we got what, whom we thought was the right executive director for the group. Uh, now we're working on our metrics. Uh, so it, it's, I, I want to be clear, this is not, this isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, it has to be done right. Just like these CEOs got to the point they were willing to make the commitment. That was a journey they set, set themselves on and they're still on a listening learning journey. So yes, what we have is each of these companies are undertaking their own work We've gotten them a list of resources and people with whom they can work with and, and contract with and so on. Um, and they are beginning the process. We're using the work of each that is doing something that we think is really stellar, communicating it to all other companies to make sure we're sharing the best practices, if you will, of their colleagues. And anybody outside our membership who maybe didn't join but still wants to know that, we're sharing anywhere and everywhere. Uh, we have a, a monthly newsletter from our executive director. In it, we share what's going on and how, how, what progress is being made by individuals and how they got to where they did and what work they've accomplished so that they can see the reality of, yes, it can be done, it is being done, and they can consult with each other. Yeah, this is good. This is a great conversation for our members to be hearing because there's so many leaders in our group. I love it. All right, particularly a, a particular concern towards providing equity has been the accumulation of wealth. 
a relatively new area that needs to be addressed. It seems that businesses and particularly our banks can make a difference in this area by providing mortgage assistance. What say you? Exactly. Uh, home ownership is the most typical way that we pass wealth on to the next generation. And when you look at the data with regard to home ownership, uh, you can tell there isn't any wealth being passed on, or not literally, but very little wealth being passed on because there isn't home ownership by Black Washingtonians. So we have convened uh, the leadership of the banks to say, what can you do? And that is a process we began several months ago. And we're in the process of looking at whether it's what the application calls for in the mortgage loan. What does the interviewer call for in that process? It, can you give some assistance uh, to at least get it going? We're having that same conversation with the legislature. Are there ways in which we can, will we give out uh, help for those who can't otherwise afford in whatever means? Is there a way to begin the process that that money just doesn't go to rent, but beyond, as I mentioned earlier, so we're in the process of doing what you're talking about because the inability to pass on generation to generation is a high priority. Can you share your slides with us? Oh, of course, yes. Okay, great, then we'll figure that out later. That's a good, that was a quick question. There is a lot of autonomy with these communities to progress, but where is the accountability? For us, you mean? Is I that what you're saying? So, yes. Well, I mean, Technically, uh, there's, there's no law, there's no rule, there's no regulation, right? So that's why we built in the public accountability. Mm -hmm. That is the very heart and soul of why these CEOs, I don't know if anybody else has done that, which is in part why it's unique in the country, has said, we will report out at least every two years what success we've achieved and where we have not, and we will undertake to do course corrections. So we're, we're subjecting ourselves on a voluntary basis to public accountability. Okay, I like it. How can our club help you? How can we support your efforts? So, you know, all too often when we try to tackle issues like this, they're passing. They're passing. So, they're at the forefront of our attention and our good intentions, but they're not sustained. And so I really have come to believe that since the 60s, this really may be the biggest opportunity for us collectively to address racial inequity and succeed, but only if it's not a passing issue, only if it is sustained, only if we all engage so for those who are corporate leaders, join us. For those who are members of corporations, suggest that your corporation join us. Uh, and even if you don't join this body, please look at the commitments. Ask yourself, is your workplace welcoming to all? How do you measure that? How do you know that? Do you have equity, whether it's in promotion or hiring or uh, in your supplier uh, persons, have, do you have that? If so, how do you know? Are you doing self-auditing? Have you ever done self-auditing to look at these kinds of things? And then join in advocating. Join in advocating at, to the city level, to the county level, and the state level. Uh, I believe Washington State, with all the success of its history, and look at COVID. We're the model in the country, literally the model in the country, in the public, nonprofit, and private sector, all three sectors, the community stood up and did what it needed to do and could do. If we could lead on this again. We could be the model for the rest of the country, but only if we're all committed, if we're all doing our fair share to make sure it's not a passing issue. It is a issue that is there and will be, our efforts will be sustained until we are successful and i don't know when that day will come all right have i like this next question because i was going to ask you the same thing myself have you considered annually sharing the data of your research with the media so that the public takes ownership of the responsibility to reduce this disparity of opportunities based on race and ethnicity really good point so 
we did this study and we did it different than any other study we've seen, right? So we went across the lifetime of an individual who's a black Washingtonian. We, we did it uh, generationally and we didn't look at issues in silos. And let me just be clear, it's hard when you do this. One, we don't have good data. Uh, how you measure one thing in foster care is not how you measure something else in healthcare. So we don't even have a good basic way to get the data. So one of the things we're advocating legislatively is let's have the University of Washington on every year or two years, whatever, publish a report consistent with this kind of criteria that can tell our community at large, our state at large, we've made progress or we haven't. And the responsibility is with all of us to ensure that it does. And when the statistics say we haven't, we all own it and we all commit to make a change. It would be interesting to create some media partners that grew, that watched you grow, that watched this thing move and succeed, right? That they checked in with you, that it wasn't just some blip on the map. All right, I'm gonna maybe end with this. I'm gonna probably end with this last question. It's nice to see and hear how the black folks have been talking about these issues for decades. What has sparked this interest at this time? How can we as Blacks trust that this won't simply be a feather in the windstorm and be blown away in a month, year or more? Last question. Totally agree. I, I couldn't agree more. And I'll just take it from my own lifetime. Uh, in the 60s, uh, I was among those who were advocating for racial equality. Uh, remember our inner cities were burning. Um, you know, we had, I mean, just if, you, if, you, if you're not old enough to remember any of this, just Google it because uh, I don't want to spend our time on this for the moment. Uh, but uh, bottom line is uh, we thought we did a lot. We thought we did a lot. We thought we accomplished a lot. We thought we put ourselves on a track of racial equality. Well, did we accomplish some things? Yes. Overall, I would give us a D minus because now when we look, what is it that we failed to do as we went along from that late 60s to the present to understand that we were failing? How did we fail to, to do that? That's why we're advocating. We want statistics every two years to tell us if we're failing in the state of Washington because only if we put light on the subject, only if we're open and transparent about it, are we going to make the changes. Now, to black Washingtonians, you have every right based on history to say, show me. And that's what we're doing. We're not just putting out a commitment and say, look at our, that's why we didn't put out a statement last June, because it's easy to make some words. It's far more important to make a commitment and execute on that commitment and succeed. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can't ask you to trust right now. I can ask you to stick with us and help us because it's one thing for us to make the commitment. It's another thing for us to know how to accomplish success. And we want black Washingtonians to help us in this effort. We are committed. And then in the first three to five years, see if we failed. And if we did, call us out. Chris, Christine, former Governor Gregoire, thank you so much. This is awesome. This was really a powerful conversation and we really appreciate it. There's a lot of questions. I don't know if you have a minute to check them out. There's a lot of kudos for you. You might want to check those out because who doesn't want to see that? Uh, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. All right. Quick shout out to our, uh, to our sponsors. I will start off with Joe Farrell. Thank you so much. Our good friends over at Columbia Bank. Our dear friends over at Neck Tech. You may recognize that handsome, that handsome fella. Uh, and that's it. Listen, have a great week. Keep it real. President Jeff, back to you. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, uh, Chris Gregoire, and a great, very thought-provoking program. Uh, we'll have to have you back in the not-too-distant future.